line of 7181. And channel bonding. What is channel bonding? Channel bonding is basically an 802.11n feature that lets you take two 20 megahertz channels and combine them to 40. Uh, that's pretty, uh, you're going to see that on the 5X radios a lot outdoors. If you have a really noisy outdoor 2.4 environment, most likely the 2.4 radios will only sit there in 20 megahertz mode. Um, I've seen a bunch of deployments that I've done on the 7181 that had absolutely no interference in the 2.4, and they did sit at the 40 megahertz. So getting to that 40 megahertz channel of channel bonding uh, will let you double the data rate. So these are the uh, five key features in 802.11n technology. But you just, just having MIMO doesn't mean that you have a product with high capacity uh, and it's a great outdoor product. You basically need all three, all five of these, and you need to tune them for your environment. So understanding MIMO. Everybody's familiar with BG access points or Wi-Fi hotspots that have been out there. Most of them have been deployed with BG nodes. That means one transmit, one receive per radio. So you see one antenna for each radio. So if the radio was a dual radio AP, you'd see two antennas on it. Well, now, MIMO, you're going to start to see multiple antennas per radio. And most products I've seen are 1 by 3, 2 by 2, 3 by 3. So MIMO means multiple input, multiple output. So you're going to see multiple receive and transmit antennas on different products out there. And that's the basic difference between MIMO, you know, a single, what I call uh, single input, single output. Okay, just look at this uh, single input, single output at BG nodes, and look at the MIMO as all the end nodes. So understanding MIMO, you're going to see this number a lot on data sheets, 3x3, three 2x2, by three, three by, uh, two by two. I've seen 1x3. What the first number means is the number of transmit chains. The second number, that green number, means the number of receive chains. And sometimes you'll see a colon, too. Most of the industrial chips, uh, 80211 chips out there, have a dual stream. I've seen one chip. I think the Marvel chip has a 4x4. Four four. I can tell you most people will not build products with 4x4 four four because of the cost of the antenna system and um, the actual cost to put that product into um, for design and manufacturability, and the diminishing returns. We've really studied the difference between a 2x2, two 3x3, two, three three, and a 4x4, four four and what the um, dB gain is outdoors. So 3x3 uh, three three looks like it's this per um, outdoor access point. We've seen 2x2. Two two. It depends what kind of power is on the radio. So multiple transmitted data streams is really important. It delivers multiple data streams so you can get to those really high data rates that it, uh, everybody claims. And it does not require a MIMO AP or a MIMO climate to take, take um, into account the mul multiple transmitted data streams. So the multiple uh, received data streams, basically, in, that's to receive MRC gains. You're going to see, hear the word MRC, MRC. That just means your clients can hear better. So it works with MIMO clients and legacy clients. And, and it's the ability to increase the receive sensitivity on your clients that are out there. So um, multiple unique data streams. Remember I said before about getting to that second data stream is really important? That's to increase your data rate. So if I only had a single stream, getting to a single stream would be an MRC0 to an MRC7. Those are the, uh, the coding schemes for 802.11n. If you only got to a single data stream, the max data rate you can get is 157 meg. But getting to the dual data stream lets you get to these data rates that everybody's been publishing for the radio, which is a max of 300 megabits uh, per second. Now, keep in mind, those are data rates. That's not effective throughput. I have some charts later on that talk about effective throughput. So getting to that second data stream outdoor is key in 802.11n to get to the uh, data rates and end that everybody's talking about. So enabling applications with a mesh. Um, I like to share this with a lot of partners because it really gets you thinking on what kind of applications uh, that I, we've seen mesh in. We tr traditionally come from the public safety market um, where we basically deploy these systems for mobility and for the public safety market for police, EMS, fire. They use it for the mobile office. It's just like taking their what I call their police vehicle, out into the field. They never have to come back and do reports. They can basically have broadband in their car, be able to see the cameras that are on the network, be able to do their e-ticketing, e-citation.
example, over in Europe, we mesh a bunch of bus stops. The um, city of Glasgow had a lot of problems with keeping their buses on time and the traffic congestion. So they installed mesh components. And so they didn't blanket the whole city. They just installed mesh components in their little bus depots. And they also put mesh components in on the buses. So when the bus approached the uh, depot, it would tell us that it was arriving at a certain time. That, in turn, went back to a network and controlled all the traffic lights in the city. The traffic lights would change based on if the bus was on time or not. So, And that was a way, there was about four companies involved in that, to keep all the buses on time in a very congested um, uh, traffic situation. Video surveillance, fixed cameras, red light districts, public transit. I see a lot with cameras, especially now with 802.11n and the data rates that we can do. We, I basically taxied out a lot of our products with the new HD cameras that are out on the market. So video surveillance is probably one of the key market drivers for um, outdoor Wi-Fi. And I'll go over a bunch of use cases after this uh, for different customers. Multi-use networks, very key. And what that means is the city might or the project might have funded the mesh technology or the um, mesh Wi-Fi broadband outdoors by one particular project, like for, I'll give you an example, smart utilities or being able to read meters. But then they use that network for other applications and other uh, city officials so that they can basically grow that network into multi-use cases. So they might have funded the whole project one way, but their ROI comes from a bunch of different um, entities within the city that take advantage of that network. And you can segregate that with VLANs and different types of um, networking capability. So I've seen uh, networks funded for parks and video surveillance and then taken advantage of for other opportunities. And meshes are always grown, I call it. They might go in there with two or three nodes to mesh a city park, and next you know the whole city is meshing because they're offering other um, applications on that network. Education, that's pretty big. Indoor, it's been uh, a bunch of indoor access points. You're going to see a lot outdoor because probably just about every kid has an Android phone or a smartphone out there. We've seen a lot of need for outdoor access points. And with the AT7181, we could blanket um, very large areas and provide really great coverage for what I call low-power devices. Uh, industrial markets, we're in a bunch of different ports. This is a segment. We have vehicle-mounted modems from our BG product. Uh, they're called VMMs, vehicle-mounted modems. We can actually talk to our legacy uh, BG nodes, and we usually um, put those in different uh, vehicles. And in, for, in particular, in the industrial markets, we'll put it on the vehicles that are being tracked at a port. So we can combine our different technologies. And vehicle mounted modems and mobility is not just pedestrian mobility. We're talking vehicle mobility. So that's pretty key. And what you're seeing with 802.11n is you've got more users, more applications, and uh, uh, ability to have more capacity. It's been very important. This is a picture of the AP7181 on the top of, uh, this is part of our alpha network. And you'll see to the left down there, that's just a Sony camera. I think that's a 550 that's painted on the uh, wall. We have fine restrictions here, so everything has to be painted. Here's a little bit about some of the beta testing that we did with uh, the government. Uh, we tried to push the limits to the 7181 here to determine the bandwidth limitation. Basically, you'll see an unmanned vehicle. You'll see it to the left there is an AP-71 on the top of a mining. Uh, it's actually a top of a refinery. A lot of snow on the ground. All those pictures in the middle are a FLIR camera, an access camera, and a Sony camera that were mounted on board of that unmanned vehicle. And they were pushing some significant data rate a mile away and trying to um, test what the throughput limits were. So my customer came back and said it, he called it a big screaming monster of the 802.